Okay, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, Michel Manges uh, speaking today about uh, road traffic dynamics as a complex network. So uh, please go ahead. Well, thanks, uh, Jay, for uh, the introduction and also for inviting me. Um, so when you invited me, I was thinking about <clears throat> what a right topic would be to, to, uh, to talk about. So quite a bit of the work I do is, let's say, a bit more foundational and perhaps not so uh, logical to present in this uh, this seminar but then I thought well maybe this topic is um, also because it involves quite a few features that play a role in the let's say the deep mindsets uh, that you guys have so multi-scale modeling uh, it's pretty much physics oriented what I'll talk about and I felt that this relates uh, well should relate uh, well to to what you guys are doing um, Another thing that is perhaps nice to, to mention, it's about road traffic uh, dynamics. It's a topic that I didn't work on for, well, until like five years ago or so. So it's relatively new to me and I liked it very much as a topic. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start with uh, a few general remarks about road traffic modeling. Um, so in the first place, I think you can look at road traffic models with different levels of abstraction. Um, well, there's the time scale issue that obviously plays a role. Am I going to look at a very detailed time scale or more like a like a, a more coarse time scale? Um, what is the objective of my road traffic model? Of course, that has a lot of impact on the type of models that you would like to use. Um, the conclusion, I guess, at this point is that those networks are a sort of ideal playground for, let's say, practical modelers but also for more fundamentally oriented scientists. So there's a lot going on in this area. And I'll try to sketch you, well, what this area is in my view and what kind of things you, you could do. Um, so it's partly about my own work and partly more like high level background um, to make sure that it's uh, like an accessible talk for, for everybody. Um, one of the interesting things about road traffic modeling is that it's basically a topic that is not only done by one subset of scientists, but really, uh, well, by all kinds of scientists. So in the first place, I think it's uh, done by civil engineers uh, who are traffic engineers um, who try to well come up with uh, layouts and designs to achieve safe and efficient movement of people in goods on roadways. That's how they define themselves. In the second place, I guess there is a lot of operations research going on because you have to design a network and OR is very much about the allocation of scarce resources in an optimal fashion. So quite often in an environment that is complex and with intrinsic random features. Uh, also physicists work a lot on road traffic models because they like to see them as like a, an analog of uh, well, particle models that they're familiar with. Uh, computer scientists work a lot on it. Uh, so they try to analyze complex networks, for instance, through machine learning techniques. And in the last place, there is also a lot of interest from people from economics, uh, also because of the, let's say, the economic value of congestion that they try to model. So if I use a model that's bad for other people, because, well, you impose a negative externality on the network. So the bottom line of this slide is that there is, well, a lot of attention for road traffic modeling, and it's nice to combine perspectives. So my own perspective then, well, my background is in applied math and OR uh, with a focus on, on randomness, random features. And well, basically all the work I do is, let's say at the fundamental end of the spectrum, but always with some application potential. So like here, I also try to interact with people from practice to make sure that I work on the right model and they know about the things that I, uh, I discover. Um, so the interaction with people with a more practical mindset is very important in my uh, point of view. A few words about the, the bigger context in which I do this research. Well, that is that gravitation grant networks. Um, so it says 2014 till 2024, but it's actually 2025. Because of COVID, we could go on for one more year. 
not with additional money, but we have the right to spend our money uh, more slowly. That's basically what it is. Um, so the project is rooted in math and uh, NCS. So it has stochastic elements, algorithmic elements, and the partners involved are UVA, CWI, Leiden, and Eindhoven. And actually, the project that I'm going to talk about today is done with uh, with a guy from uh, from the VU, Jaap Storm, who was my PhD uh, student till uh, till recently. Um, well, I think it's fair to say that the primary interest is in fundamental understanding of networks, but it's also very much about its ramification in the design and control of complex system, among which road traffic networks is a very important example. And uh, um, yeah, that is basically the topic that I'm going to discuss today. Okay, so let's focus a bit more. Uh, what are the goals of road traffic research? Well, basically, it all always amounts to things uh, revolving around design and control. So the long-term design goals uh, are, for instance, like, uh, well, design your network in such a way that there is sufficient capacity, right? If you design the roads, uh, the highway network of the Netherlands, that's one of the, well, the most dominant questions. Of course, there are also short-term design goals that is very much about the efficient layout of like a, like an intersection, and merging procedures, that kind of things. There are then the long-term control goals. So then you can think of, uh, well, procedures to impose toll on uh, drivers in your network in such a way that well, congestion can be controlled. And there are also things like short-term control goals and that could be something like, well, adaptive measures to regulate streams of traffic. So these, uh, these matrix things that you have on the highway are an example of that. So these models that people have been using to, uh, well, to resolve all those issues on the previous slide, well, they differ in various ways. And I guess the most uh, important way in which they differ is the aggregation level. So there are models with a very fine resolution really like distinguishing cars. But there are also models in which you abstract from that and you work with flows and then it becomes more like, a, well, a, a physics type of approach where there is some fluid flowing through a network. In the second place, there is the time resolution that plays a role. Are we working with some, uh, well, lumping over well, time intervals or do we work with uh, like finer time intervals? And there's also the spatial resolution. Uh, do we work with a precise, precise network layout, which can be extremely detailed, or do we do some, let's say, spatial lumping of like, like neighborhoods, for instance? Well, in the literature, and I think that's very close to the, the stuff that you think about on a daily basis, there is like this difference between microscopic models that distinguish individual cars and that work at a fine time scale and macroscopic models, uh, which are basically modeling traffic as, well, fluid flowing through a network. And of course, then you will end up with like differential equations that you would like to analyze. So this is my summary of, well, the distinction that you see between macroscopic and microscopic modeling in, in this type of networks. So uh, macroscopic models, well, they work with traffic flows, as I mentioned, while microscopic models distinguish individual cars. Uh, in terms of like dynamics, well, the more macroscopic you, you make it, the easier it becomes, which is good. Um, in the macroscopic world, quite often things are deterministic. So you don't uh, pay any attention to, well, like the random features that, that play a role. I'll say much more about that uh, later in this talk. In microscopic modeling, well, you do incorporate uh, randomness. Well, in macroscopic models, well, I write here explicit formulas, but quite often it's not entirely explicit, but still like, relatively easy to analyze. So you may need some numerics, but it's, it's doable. Uh, a full microscopic model, as you can imagine, becomes extremely hard, also in terms of estimation of parameters and stuff. 
So very hard to, to deal with that. And quite often simulation is uh, relied upon. Um, in terms of, well, the cars moving through the network, well, the macroscopic models typically work with a single class, while in the microscopic world, you can have like different classes of, of vehicles that, well, uh, behave in different manners. So th this is like the high level distinction between the two of them. Um, the important takeaway here is that, well, basically, uh, well, things are not deterministic also because there is the, the human factor involved in well, driving style and reactions of people to situations. So that already requires, well, working with a, st a stochastic model. And the aim of, uh, well, that my, my student had in his PhD research was to develop a flexible stochastic traffic flow model because we want to have something stochastic, uh, consistent with the, the physical models that, well, that you see on the macroscopic level. But of course, things should still be like computable. So um, it should be as detailed as possible, but still, uh, well, uh, amenable for, for, for numerical analysis. So that is summarized on this slide. So there are these microscopic models uh, and those work with, well, physical laws like uh, differential equations and stuff based on kinematic wave theory. There are the microscopic models in which you can put in a lot of detail on how cars are moving based on what they observe in their neighborhood. So quite often they, quite often they use like cellular automata to do that. And we want to go for, let's say, a middle ground in which we still have a stochastic model with some aggregation to make it like computable, but still in line with those physical laws. So uh, to make sure that, well, on average, the, the macroscopic models are satisfied. And well, the goal is that with this middle ground, we can do some explicit analysis. And the way we go about it is that we go for a so-called diffusion approximation. So that is the, the way to go. So this is the roadmap to have in mind. Uh, before going to our own work, I'll sketch you, uh, well, basically my view on what has been done in let's say the macroscopic and microscopic domain and the pros and cons of both approaches. And I'll do that in a bit more detail. Um, in both fields, I'm not really an expert, so you may know much more about it than I do. I'll try to give you the, well, the, uh, the, the main message and uh, hopefully, uh, well, that gives you the, the right perspective. So let's start with uh, the macroscopic models and quite often they are based on what is called kinematic wave models. So what is the, the framework to think about in this context? Well, basically there is like, a, well, the simplest model works with an interval over which cars move. And let's say X is the position in an interval. Well, the thing you care about is that you would like to know the traffic density at that point, at every point in time. And that is the row XT. And of course, well, the, the flow uh, present at point X has some velocity, some speed of moving. And uh, well, that is uh, the, the V of X and T. And it's not so hard to imagine that there should be some conservation laws uh, in place. Um, well, this one is a very obvious one, conservation of mass. So you look at a connected segment, x1 up to x2, over a time interval. And then it's not so hard to see that you should have this kind of con uh, conservation laws. It's basically a matter of, uh, well, uh, a little bit of bookkeeping, what uh, leaves your segment over a time interval and what enters your segment and that you can write down in two different ways and then you end up with this form. So this is the integral form of this uh, conservation of mass relation. But of course, you can also write it in an in infinitesimal form and that is known as a so-called simple transport equation. So that is the one over here. So this is an example of a kinematic wave model that well, people in road traffic modeling use a lot when they work at that flow level. Um, important is that 
it is typically assumed that the velocity is a function of the density. And that is not so strange, right? So if you are confronted with a certain density in your network that says how fast you can move, right? If the density is low, uh, well, of course, there is like a free flow regime in which you don't have any interaction with other cars. But if the density goes up, and the extreme form is a traffic jam, well, you, your speed will go down. An important concept is also the flow, and the flow is the product of, uh, well, the, the density and the velocity. So that was something that we already came across here, right? So that is the flow. Well, one of the uh, diagrams that you see in virtually any paper on road traffic modeling is this one. So it's about uh, what they call the macroscopic fundamental diagram. And that is basically a relation between density and flow. And that is precisely the relation that I was mentioning. So if the density goes up, well, then in the beginning, the flow also grows sort of linearly. That makes sense. But at some point, it goes down. And that is because of the let's say the negative externalities between the cars. So they uh, suffer from each other. And at some point the, the speed goes down. And this point over here is the, uh, well, the, uh, the traffic jam that is uh, taking place there. So also in terms of velocity, you can make, well, a diagram. So velocity decreases when density increases. And that makes sense. The more other cars there are on the road, the slower you drive. Right. So this is one of the empirically backed uh, principles that is often used in road traffic modeling. So can I ask you something? Of course. Yeah. So, so the, is the understanding that there is a scale that is large enough such that you know this equation just governs all we want to know about uh, traffic flows? Yeah, like, more or less. So I had actually the same question. Maybe the next slides gives a bit more insight in it. So what, what they basically did is making scatter plots. So they uh, measured uh, densities and flows, and basically they observed this kind of thing. So then it's basically a matter of, uh, well, uh, well, drawing like a line through it. Uh, but of course, this I looks just wonder, extremely I just, deterministic. Uh, and I just, it, I, I just wonder, if, of, please. Yeah, I just wonder if you don't need other things like uh, you know drag, like uh, viscosity or something to yeah, although the yeah. flow. Uh, True. So it's really first order, and um, other things are obviously like um, if you have like a multi-lane scenario or single lane that plays a role. Uh, what the mix is between cars and and and, and trucks and that kind of thing. Uh, so I, I think it's a simplistic uh, relation in a way, but still good enough to capture the, the main effects. That's the way I see it. Uh, of course, when you build a model, a legitimate question would be if I try to, if I would like to improve my model, would this be the thing to improve? Or is there another like weak spot in my story? Right. Uh, my sense would be that this is one of the weaker spots. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I had the same thoughts as you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so these scatter plots, uh, well, they you, you can see them in, in tons of papers. And basically, that's the, well, the empirical backing of the, of the, of the shape of the curve. Um, so it also means that we can replace the rho times v in our uh, PDE by the, by the Q, and then you end up with this uh, traffic version of the transport equation. OK, so this is what they empirically observed. Um, well, one way uh, to go from this, this model to something that I like to work with is, is the following procedure. So if you have your segment, so I don't think about a network yet, but just a segment. Suppose that I split it up into cells. Cells have some positive length. And I also discretize time. And basically what you can do is, is the following. So you take an initial density that is piecewise constant per cell. Um, so this density I call rho 
of xi and t. And then it turns out, and I don't know the details about that, but it turns out to be possible to come up with an exact solution of this uh, of this row. And basically, it uh, uh, well is given by this this relation over here. Um, what you have to do is to solve d minus one Riemann problems, as it turns out, and in some cases for some shapes of the uh, fundamental diagram that is actually possible. So important, a very important object in the, in the remainder of the talk is the so-called discrete flux function. And basically what that does is that as a function of the vehicle densities in your cell and the next cell, it says how fast you can move to the next cell. And that is of course an interesting concept. Um, we already argued that the speed of moving depends on the density in the current cell. But of course, also the room available in the next cell has impact, right? There is a kind of back pressure mechanism going on. So that is the reason why we use the arguments, two arguments, namely the density in the sending and receiving cell. So this is a very important feature of the models that we will be working with. So in a graph, um, it's basically something like that. So if you, the, the right picture is actually the more revealing one. So there is something like a, a sending function and a receiving function. So if the density increases, well, then you can send more and more until you hit the boundary. And the receiving function, if the next cell is uh, full or sort of empty, then well, uh, it's good for you because then you can, uh, the flow can be higher and that decreases with the density of the receiving cell. The minimum of the two is binding and that leads you to the left picture. So this is the uh, macroscopic fundamental diagram that we will be working with. Um, yeah, so one of the, the things we found weak about this approach is that it typically doesn't take into account that traffic is heterogeneous. And for that reason, one of our ambitions was to extend uh, the theory that was available to a multi-class setting. Uh, basically, the starting point is then, well, the, uh, the conservation equation, but then for M types, well, there's nothing fancy going on there. And of course, they interact with each other. Uh, and it's good that also that Godenoff technique that I showed you on the previous or one of the previous slides still works. But then, of course, your flow uh, should be then like a function of all the densities of all the, the types in the sending cell and all the densities in the receiving cell. So it becomes a more complex uh, object. So this is all you need to know before I start to talk about our own uh, way of modeling things regarding the micro, sorry, the, yeah, the mi sorry, the macroscopic approach. But, but I have a, a question. Yeah. Uh, Jay also had one? Or no? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And I was wondering, so, so you distinguish types based on their velocity function. Is, is that the only way in which they differ? Uh, that's a good point, actually. No, it's also that like like a bus or a truck takes more space, and that, okay. that you can incorporate in the, uh, in the fundamental diagram as well. And also in a multi-lane model, that they tend to stick to the to the right lane. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 So th these features you can uh, you can plug in uh, mm -hmm. right? because you basically work with uh, the densities of all the types. Okay. Yeah, my, my question. question uh, yeah, 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 it was just more like you didn't specify how they interact. I was just wondering uh, what. Yeah, so that is all encoded basically in that uh, that Q function, and you can, in principle, do that in the way you like. I'll okay. say a bit more about that uh, okay. when okay. I discuss our contribution. Basically, okay. we we picked a Q that was empirically found by other people for like a, a, a multi-type model. Okay. Yeah. Empirically found, you mean uh, someone who looked really at traffic and uh, yeah, okay, yeah. All right, all right. Yeah. okay. So let's move on to the the microscopic models, and 
I write here cellular automata. I guess that's the most basic microscopic model that people have been using so far. Um, well, I guess you know what a, mic uh, what a cellular automaton is. Uh, uh, for other audiences, I in, uh, included this slide, but uh, well, basically what it is, is that the rule of, um, well, the behavioral rule depends on what is happening around you. So it's a model that works with cells and the dynamics of a cell depend on what is happening around that cell. Um, as you can imagine, it's a very logical model to use in road traffic modeling. Uh, the reason is that, well, basically the way you drive depends on what you see around you. And that's the reason, well, people in uh, road traffic modeling got interested. Uh, one very nice survey is this one by uh, Mari Foot and the Moor. So you can, uh, can have a look at it and it's a very nice, uh, yeah, general treatment of this kind of models in the road traffic context. Um, yeah, it's a, in a way a programming paradigm from statistical physics. I think that's, uh, that's fair to say. It works with discrete time steps and space is coarse grained. So you work with cells, each being empty or containing a vehicle. Um, well, it's all about incorporating those behavioral rules. And basically it's all about understanding how the behavioral rule that applies locally translates to what happens globally, right? That is the objective of the whole thing. And the main advantage, at least in the way I see it, is that you can simulate it very easily. So it allows for efficient and fast performance evaluation if you plug it into uh, well, a simulator. Very suitable for microscopic modeling, obviously. But, uh, well, if you want to do performance analysis, it can be uh, a bit annoying because the only thing you can do is a uh, simulation, unlike, unless you have a very simple cellular automata. Um, yeah, these slides, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether these are things that all of you already know. So it's about the history of, uh, of cellular automata, how it started with von, von Neumann long ago, 70 years ago, and how it has been gradually become more and more popular also because of Turing working on it. And at some point, well, there was this uh, uh, game of life that people got interested in and uh, showing all kinds of bizarre uh, behaviors. But I guess the bottom line is that it became more and more used in practice uh, also because of the uh, the efforts by Wolfram, the guy of the uh, computer software. Uh, he really did a lot of work in popularizing the concept and well, uh, I guess uh, it has been uh, becoming more and more uh, popular because of that. So how does a cellular automaton formally work? Well, it works with uh, uh, a physical environment, each grid point is a cell. A cell can be, well, in the basic form in two, two states. A cell has a neighborhood and for each cell, uh, that's a collection of other cells that locally determines its evolution. And then there is something like a local transition rule and that defines how the states of a state of a cell changes based on the states of what you see around you. So that is summarized in this uh, four tuple. Um, suppose that you look at an example on the line. Well, the line is uh, set Z. The states can be zero or one. Uh, the neighborhoods could be the cell in front of you, your own cell and cell behind you. And the local transition rule could be something like that prescribes how you uh, move as a function of what you see around you. So this is an example, the wolf from 184. So here you see the, uh, well, the, the cell behind you, the cell itself and the, the cell in front of you. Black means occupied, white means not occupied. And that's, well, the, 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 the bottom cell tells you how, what in the next time slot happens to, to that cell. So uh, the, the 184 basically encodes all the possibility here possibilities here and you can imagine how that works in a sort of binary way. So this one uh, is extremely simple and already surprisingly okay. One of the 
very nice uh, things about it is that you can uh, make, well, beautiful pictures with it. This is a so-called space-time diagram. So here you see space and time is running like that. And basically you observe, uh, well, a black dot is a vehicle and a, a white space is no vehicle. And you see that under light traffic, that's the left picture, well, the cars are moving sort of uh, independently of each other through this segment. The right panel is uh, a situation with, with a high density and then, well, the starts the, the vehicle starts to start to interfere more intensively. And then you have these backward moving waves. That's a very interesting phenomenon that you, of course, observe in real highways as well. One of the cool things of, of these experiments is that if you do them, then you can actually reproduce the fundamental diagram that we postulated long ago. So there's not only empirical backing for it, but also, well, starting with like a logical empirical rule based on the cellular automaton, you get something that is actually in line with uh, the fundamental diagram. So uh, if you simulate uh, that network for a long time and you observe, well, the, uh, on, a, on a segment, what the density is and the flow, and well, basically you get lots of, uh, of points. And if you then try to draw a line through them, then you will see something that very much looks like this, uh, this diagram. Um, well, this was all about, well, positions of cars in the cell in front of you and behind you. Of course, you can also let, let it depend on the vehicles of those cars. Uh, so you can make the, uh, the cellular automaton increasingly complex to make it more realistic. It fits very nicely in the CA framework. And that's the reason, of course, why those cellular automata are so, uh, uh, so powerful. It's an ideal framework to model the human factor, I think. And well, it allows easy simulation. I guess the most popular simple model that people are using is the one by Nagel and Schreckenberg, which is effectively Wolfram 184. Uh, but also includes a probabilistic uh, mechanism, um, basically to, uh, to make sure that the human factor also comes into the picture. So there is this parameter P that regulates the probability of speed reduction based on what you observe around you. And then the, the pictures become less deterministic, obviously. Uh, you see here the effect of the the parameter p here the p is 0.1 here the p is 0.5 and the well one of the conclusions that uh, nagel and schreckenberg found was that randomization leads to the a phenomenon that they call phantom mini jams so even in situations with light load you every now and then have traffic jams because of the random effects that uh, that play a role Okay, so this slide is a reminder um, just to tell you where we are in the story. We had this dichotomy between macroscopic and microscopic. I gave you like a very brief account of what macroscopic and microscopic models do, uh, but also mentioning their disadvantages. And one of the, the aims that we would like to have is to bridge that gap between the two of them, uh, working in the stochastic context, but still in line with, let's say, on average, in line with the uh, with the kinematic wave models. And um, well, the ideal solution would be to find a model in which we can still compute things efficiently, so that we don't have to rely on uh, stochastic simulations. So that is the uh, the goal. And then. The last part of my talk starts, namely the, the part about our own research in which we exp explicitly try to bridge that gap. Okay, so what is the framework that we will be working in? Um, we work with a segment, but it could also be like a network with, with, with nodes and that are connected by segments. But for now, to keep everything simple, I work with segments. <laughs> these segments and they have like an, a length, uh, L sub i is the length of, uh, of cell i, multiple vehicle types because we felt it's important to work with that. 
um, the quantity that we are after is the stochastic process xijt, which uh, is the number of type J vehicles in cell I at MT. Um, quite often we work with like a slightly different quantity, namely the density, which is basically the xijt divided by L. So then you have like the number of cars per kilometer at any point in time. Well, we assume that there is this, uh, this flow function that we have been discussing before. So the, let's say the flow of moving from one cell to the next per uh, vehicle type, well, that's depending on the densities of all vehicle types in the present cell and also in the cell in front of you. Um, well, we were assuming a few, uh, well, regularity conditions in order for our formal results to hold. And I'm not gonna say much about it, but it's a regularity condition that states that, that, states that this Q is continuous in a specific way, Lipschitz continuous. And under that condition, we are able to, well, prove a number of fundamental properties of this, this system. It's important to notice that the model that we built uh, is a Markovian model as long as you uh, make the transitions between uh, of vehicles jumping through the network exponentially distributed. So basically, um, we say that the, the parameter of the, these exponential distributions, qij, which is the, uh, the rate that the type j vehicle in cell i jumps to the next cell, is in line with the, the flow function that we described. So on average, it does the right thing. That is basically the idea here. But because we make these times exponential, we enter the Markovian world. And well, the Markovian world is nice because then hopefully we can analyze things. So one step in our analysis that we rewrite our model slightly and that we do by representing the vehicle densities in terms of Poisson processes, unit rate Poisson processes, uh, and that we can do because of the exponentiality here. Basically what is said in this equation is that the density at time t is the initial density plus what entered from the previous cell between zero and t minus what has left from your, your cell i between zero and t. So this is the, well, one of the ways to represent the dynamics, the stochastic dynamics, if you wish, of your, uh, well, the, the, the population per cell. Can I ask a fast question about this? Of course. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I guess the, the Poisson process, you're counting discrete. Yes. Uh, quickly, yes. right? And density is continuous. So uh, how do you do the connection between these two? Yeah. Yeah, um, that's true. But uh, this density is, uh, well, it's actually not continuous in the sense that it's always a multiple of one over L. And L is the, the length of the... Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I see. but I could have written down the same type of equation for the axis. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Of course, you have to do something special for cell one and cell D because there you don't have a previous cell or a next cell. So you have to treat them slightly differently. Yeah, I'm not gonna dwell on that, but that is something to take care of. So this is then a picture to have in mind, also in uh, relation to uh, Mauricio's question. So these are the, the rates of a single vehicle moving to a next cell, basically based on, well, what you see in your own cell and in the next cell. Well, the dimension of this Markov chain is huge, right? So there were these D cells, M vehicle types. So it lives on N to the power MD, which is an enormous state space. So it's nice that it's a Markovian model, but no way you can analyze it with standard computational tools. So in principle, you can uh, well use the techniques for the time dependent and stationary behavior of Markov chains. But in practice, yeah, it's basically a computational device that can only work for models of very small dimension. You have to bear in mind that per cell, uh, well, suppose a cell is a kilometer and on the highway, 
at most, well, you could have like 20 cars on that segment. And suppose then you have like 10 segments in a, 10 cells in a row, you have uh, three uh, vehicle types. Well, you can imagine that this grows beyond any reasonable bound. Also, an important conclusion is that results from queuing theory are not of any help here because queuing theory, theory doesn't uh, have models in which the receiving cell plays a role. So quite often it's very much about a flow that depends on the number of particles in the sending cell, but not so much in the receiving cell. So uh, that is something we, we can't use here. So what is our way out? Well, we work with the scaling. And the idea is that under a certain scaling of the whole problem, things uh, collapse to something simpler. And that simple thing, that simpler limiting model can be analyzed. The simpler model should still be stochastic, of course. So that is our ambition, to go to a limiting stochastic, stochastic model. So what is the scaling that we uh, perform? Well, there is some parameter n to be thought of as a, as a big number. We scale the, the cell length with that parameter and also the transition rates. So the L becomes N times L and the Q becomes N times Q. And we send N to infinity and hopefully we see, see something that makes sense, right? That is the, uh, the idea. So what does this scaling mean? Well, it increases the number of vehicles per cell. And as you can imagine, then random effects become less dominant and hopefully sort of controllable. But because we also scale the Q, it leaves the density flows between the cells invariant. So this picture says it all. So this is the, the starting situation. Suppose you go to segment that is twice as long. Well, then you see something that is essentially different. But if you scale the, the Q as well, then of course you intrinsically on average have the same structure. So now that we have scaled by N, also the target process that we would like to analyze the row depends on N. So that is something that we will call the row of N now. Um, under the assumption that Q is Lipschitz, then the first result that we could, uh, could derive is a, what you could see as a sort of law of large numbers. So basically you zoom out and the more you zoom out, the more the whole system collapses to something deterministic. And well, the deterministic limit is given by the solution of an integral equation, or of course, equivalently an ODE. And here you see that difference or that differential equation or that integral equation. It's basically the, let's say the expected value of that equation that I showed you with the Poisson processes. On average, this should be uh, the case. So as I mentioned before, you should see this as like a law of large numbers in the functional sense. In a functional sense, meaning that it's really a path that is converging to a limiting path. So this is nice, but of course not what you want because we also want to get a handle on this deterministic uh, limit. And that is the, the following thing that we do. So basically we look at this scaled process rho of n, we subtract that fluid limit that I showed you. So this deterministic limit, so this should be roughly zero. And interestingly, if you multiply with square root n, so you blow it up, then still you get a non-degenerate limit like you have in the CLT regime. And that is given through this uh, relation. There is something like a diffusion limit this object row hat over here converges to, well, the solution of a stochastic differential equation that is given here. Well, like you could see the fluid limit as a version of the law of large numbers, you should see this diffusion limit as a version of the CLT, but again, in the, the path space. So it's really at the path level that we have like a, a limiting, uh, uh, distributional form. 
So it's this two-step right. procedure, fluid limit being involved large numbers, diffusion limit being essentially a CLT. I had a question. Yes, of course, Jan. Uh, I was just curious, is there like a path integral representation of these equations? Because the whole structure that you get seems reminiscent of path integrals. Yeah, which are I way think so. Actually. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I would say so. I, I, I don't know the answer, to be honest, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, this okay. very much looks like that. Um, one word about the proof, very short uh, remark. Uh, basically, you can use like an existing framework uh, on po population processes and chemical reaction networks. And well, there's a sort of overarching theory that deals with this kind of dynamics. Still, for the situation at hand, you have to do some work. But uh, basically, the, well, the theory is already there. And you have to make the theory applicable to your specific model. And that is basically the work we had to do here. Still not trivial, but Fortunately, we could stand on the, on the shoulders of, of, of giants. What is the bottom line? Well, the center normalized version of the density process converges to a Gaussian process. And that Gaussian process, well, we can analyze way more easily than this pre-limit Markov chain that was having like this, this huge state space. So if you look at, well, a vector of, of, uh, of time points, then basically the uh, centered normalized versions of the row follow in the limit a normal distribution. And this normal distribution can be evaluated. So you can find the corresponding covariance matrix. It's actually a solution of like a pretty complicated set of, or complicated, well, it's a set of differential equations that you have to solve, but that you can do with like standard software uh, still, of course, there is some work to be done to well, translate your model instance in, into a program that works, but in the end, uh, that works uh, pretty smooth. So the, the mean of row hat and the, the covariance can be uh, computed easily. Well, the mean of row hat is obviously zero because of the, the centering that we do, but how you should center that can be evaluated pretty easily by solving this first fluid level differential equation. And then you can make all kinds of beautiful pictures. So I showed these uh, recently to a civil engineer from Delft and he was amazed by it. So basically what you can do is, well, uh, the standard pictures regarding, well, how uh, flow goes through a network. So all these uh, pictures are about the mean. So these are still not so surprising, but nice, I think. Uh, in a multi-type context, that was something he liked. But he liked this picture much more, namely, uh, well, we could also get a handle on deviations from it. So you also want to know something about the, the likelihood of, well, undesired events, like, uh, well, the traffic density dropping below a certain threshold or well, some other congestion related measures. And that was really the, the thing that triggered him very much. So he, he loved these pictures. Another one that's a uh, thing that he liked very much was this, uh, well, the, the thing that we could get a handle on the effect of multi-type issues. So here we had uh, cars and trucks, um, well, 100 cells with a certain length and a mix of 80% normal vehicles and 20% uh, trucks. And then you could say something about, well, uh, how they flow through the network. Of course, they have different speeds and well, in relation to the uh, remark by Janusz earlier, they have also different uh, driving styles in terms of the, the lane that they drive on. And those effects you can quantify in, in great detail, actually. And that is done in, in these, uh, these pictures. Another thing that uh, couldn't be done by standard techniques, but can be done with these, this new framework is to find the distribution of the travel time. So with uh, like the, those macroscopic models, you can uh, compute how long it takes for uh, a, a particle to go through a segment. But of course, that's only like well, a, a single value, no distribution. But with this theory, you can actually come up with a description of the uh, travel time distribution through that, uh, through that segment. 
And the way to do it is by expressing the travel time from cell I to I plus K of a type J vehicle in terms of these, uh, these processes Y that I introduced before. So without going into the details, there is this translation that you can make from the distribution of the travel time. So the event that the travel time is bigger than X in terms of, well, those, uh, those Ys that I introduced before. About these, well, we know everything in terms of their limiting behavior. We know the limiting uh, Gaussian distribution, for instance. So we can also find the, well, an approximation of the distribution of the travel time. So this is basically the result that we use there. I think I have a picture here that gives you, uh, well, uh, an example, the travel time from cell 10 to, uh, to cell 50 in a segment with, with 50 cells. The vehicle arrives there at uh, time is T is 200. Type one are cars, type two are, are trucks. And well, basically you get the, the full distribution of your travel time. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of spread, right? So it attains values between eight and 950 or so for, uh, for the cars and for the trucks values between a thousand and what is it, 1250 or so. So you can actually get a handle on, uh, well, the standard deviation, if you wish, of your travel time through that segment. So this is the density version of the same thing. Um, also important is that we could reproduce the phenomena that were identified in other papers. So for instance, that backward moving gem that I showed you, that actually comes out if you work on a pretty, under a pretty high density, then you actually see that effect. And that is shown in, in these graphs, you really see that well, the gem that occurs somewhere is actually moving to well, the first cells of your network. So it's, it starts somewhere in cell eight and in the end it ends at cell, cell zero after some uh, period of time. So that is one of the, I guess, the, the strong points of this model that it basically covers all kinds of existing models. And uh, yeah, that is of course uh, one of the desirable properties. Various extensions are possible. Uh, I already mentioned that more general networks are possible with splitting and merging and stuff. You can work with cell and time dependent rates. So right now, the examples that I gave you were uh, well, basically working with a constant inflow in cell zero, uh, but you could work with a, with a day pattern. Uh, one other thing that could be thought of is to work with a stochastic fundamental diagram. That also relates a bit to the, the question by Jay. Right now we work with the deterministic fundamental diagram, and that is of course, well, probably not accurate. And one of the very important things is, is that encapsulated in the Q functions, so those flow functions, is sort of the current state of your, well, of your network, including the maximum speed and stuff. So if you change the maximum speed, then your Q functions will change. And with these techniques, you can see what the effect is of doing that. So that is actually a very interesting uh, thing and very nice opportunity of these models. You can a priori evaluate the effectiveness of all kinds of well uh, interventions, measures, and stuff. So the paper appeared uh, last year, I think, in the, the journal Stochastic Systems. And right now, we write a paper that is more practical and that is more about let's say the accuracy and also the computational complexity of the method. So that brings me to the conclusions. Uh, well, let's start with a very obvious one. I hope I have convinced you that it's a sort of ideal playground, both for fundamental and applied uh, scientists here. So I liked it very much to think about these problems, which are a bit more practical than things I typically think about, but. Uh, gave rise to all kinds of fundamental questions. Um, you have to use techniques from various methodologies and that makes sense when you try to solve something that is more practical. Uh, the model that we came up with is a mixture of a conventional macroscopic model 
that is basically building on microscoping paradigms. And the good thing is that we could bridge that, uh, that gap in the sense that we could come up with explicit limiting results and those lent themselves to uh, well very fast uh, well computation on a on a computer and well fast meaning that's really in uh, like a few seconds you can evaluate a somewhat bigger network which is of course exactly what you would like to do and i think i stop here thank you for your attention Thanks a lot. Uh, I know you have to leave rather soon. Yeah, I can take a few minutes more. Yeah. So okay, okay. <laughs> so twelve oh five or so. Yeah, okay. It's always good. There are these meetings that, at which uh, it's actually good to be a bit later. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, okay, I can see Janos has a question. Go ahead, Janos. I had a question earlier. Ah, sorry, Peter, go first. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, I was waiting for stochastic differential equations to appear, and they appeared rather late in the story. So, given the fact that one of your initial complaints was the lack of stochastic elements in the deterministic macroscopic model, isn't there a road to go there directly from the deterministic differential equations to stochastic ones and then obtain results. Yeah, and going along question. that line, is there any uh, similarity with what the people in financial mathematics are doing? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, right now we chose the approach of uh, well working as long as possible with like this, this Markov model and stuff. But you can, of course, go for a way in which you, well, there were deterministic uh, differential models right from the start to make like uh, a stochastic version of, of those. But in my feeling that's a bit unlogical because what should, what should uh, well, the, the driving Brownian motion be? So that should be like the result of a computation rather than something that you a priori know, right? So how, how would you uh, be able to say what the structure is of those, uh, driving Brownian motions in your stochastic differential equations. Well, the problem with the method that, that you have a here, prescriptive model rather than an explanatory model. Yeah, exactly. That That is precisely the point. So we, we went for this approach because it should uh, appear as a result. And we don't want, we didn't want to plug it in as like uh, a starting point. And the resulting equations, are they similar to the ones in financial mathematics or are they entirely different? Yeah, so th these are like, like, like results that are very typical in the context of a stochastic network with uh, uh, under this scaling. So th th it's not only in, in uh, finance that you see these, but also in well population dynamics or chemical reaction networks. Basically, in all these this type of models you come across uh, well, limiting results that have the same diffusion uh, type. So there's nothing special about that, but the, the special feature is in, well, the, the rates that have been used. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, it was nice to see you again, Peter. Just uh, one addition to this, because uh, I think related to Peter's question that there might be actually a way of knowing how to add sort of the stochastic terms to your macroscopic equations if you understand a bit better what kind of uh, you know symmetry underlie the system for instance if, if you could improve the system by adding these uh, viscous terms or drag terms that would actually represent you know better the system that that tells you exactly what kind of symmetry the system would have if it's uh, some some sort of Galilean symmetry or something, and then there's actually a prescription for, you know, adding the relevant or the appropriate stochastic terms that respect the symmetry of the system. But it could first, be then you yeah. should sort of empirically validate that symmetry, right? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, what it, what is the extension that makes it better, like uh, like we discussed before, and then I think that would give you a clue of what the symmetry is and then you could add the stochastic terms that respect that symmetry yeah. that would you know that, that's a fluid dynamics perspective that's how you would do it if you had a fluid dynamic system yeah 
Yeah, I think. Any, yeah, okay. Uh, Janus, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering about networks and, and, and more complicated traffic networks where, where the agents start making decisions, different decisions at intersections and so on. Yeah, that's a very good point. Is that point. included or? No, well, we don't let them make decisions. So we uh, we include intersections and uh, well, the, the, the merging and splitting behavior, but sort of deterministically, we know where they, where they wanna go. But what you say is that uh, based on the current congestion level, they choose a route, right? And that is of course already way harder to analyze because then there is an additional feedback loop, uh, which is realistic, I think. Because if you know that there is an accident on a certain segment, then you will use another route. But that, of course, makes it uh, way harder to analyze. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but the ordinary uh, merging and splitting can be done. So if you uh, already know the route of a certain vehicle, then, then you can, uh, can do that. So you can then go for two flavors, a sort of probabilistic splitting at every intersection or a deterministic splitting. But uh, these are sort of understood. Okay, uh, there's a question by Dan. Yeah, Mauricio, Mauricio. Mauricio first. Yeah, first and then Dan, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you for the, for the interesting talk. Uh, so I was wondering, I mean, you presented the microscopic model as the cellular automata. But then uh, this is a stochastic model that you present. It seemed to me that the, the original stochastic model, the Markov chain, it's itself the microscopic model, basically even more general than the cellular automata. And then your mesoscopic model is just the central limit, uh, the model that you get in with the central limit theorem. W would this be correct? Yeah, I think that's correct, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that was all. Yeah. Okay, Dan, uh, you have a question? Yeah, let me also turn on my camera. Hi. Thanks, a nice talk, uh, Michelle. So I, I, I'm a bit curious, I'm trying to understand this, this large N limit, um, how to interpret that and, 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 and also, um, would it make sense also think about say the, the stochastic behavior that you may get if you start considering deviations from this, from this limit? Yeah, it's a bit weird limits uh, in some sense. So basically what you do is that you enlarge your cells such that per cell you have enough vehicles there to make the population of that cell roughly normal. That is basically what you do. And you have to adapt the queue basically to have like on average the same dynamics. So you, you, you're looking at essentially ever larger segments of the, of the road, for instance. In yes, yeah. but of course there is some limit to it because it, you sort of lump all the vehicles in that cell all of them have the same likelihood of moving to the next one, right? So if you uh, make the, the cells too large, then that becomes unnatural. So we have been experimenting with that quite a bit and up to like a kilometer, it seems to work quite okay. Then you have like 20 cars per segment, CLT starts to kick in at like, like 15 or so. So that, that, that is reasonably okay. Do you think then it's possible to, 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 to analyze the deviations from this limiting behavior? Uh, yeah, well, that was one of the goals, of course, the deviations in, in, the, in the central limit regime. We did but, analyze, but, but largely- yeah, I thought it was about uh, the, the, the mean, I mean, the, the, since I know you showed the results for the, 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 the mean, but also the, the variance of the, of the limiting probability distribution. But I'm yeah. thinking more about uh, the probability distributions that you may get sort of in the pre-limit. Yeah. Right, my interpreting yeah, is you, the one right now. Exactly. The, the, of course, you can translate the limiting result back to what a pre-limit would be. So basically, you get a handle on uh, stuff like, uh, well, the mean number per cell, but also like uh, the variance of the number per cell, and also things like the, the covariance between the populations in adjacent cells and that kind of thing. So the scaling is sort of artificial in a way, right? So the N doesn't exist in, in reality. So you uh, have to sort of translate your way back into, well, the actual parameters of your network. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, I think Michelle froze. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess that's it. <laughs> we don't even have to uh, clap again this time. <laughs> All right. Well.